Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining me in one of the final talks of what's been an amazing two days. I've been speaking to everybody or a lot of people in this room. This has got to be one of like my favourite conferences. Like it is so, yes, shout out to Care. Woo! Um, it is so, yes, it is so much fun. Uh, and I feel that like what my takeaway from last year was is that what people here want is action and they want to know what to do to make their campaigns better, which is so refreshing and so awesome. So so it is a real honor to be here to like try and share what I've experienced over the last few years uh, with all of you. Um, but before we dig in, I just wanted like a quick show of hands. Who here has worked on digital marketing campaigns or SEO? Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah, good mix. All right. So for those who are not aware, digital marketing basically means anything that you're doing to get more eyeballs or more people looking at your content. So it could be newsletter campaigns, it could be email campaigns, it could be uh, like Facebook ads, social media, video, things like that. And SEO uh, stands for search engine optimization. Uh, very like I was challenged to kind of try and make this fun, but yeah, search engine optimization, I'm afraid, um, is basically where you create content that makes uh, that's with Google in mind. So what you want to do is try and get people who are Googling things to see your content. Uh, and that's what SEO means. And that's what I'm going to teach you a little bit about today. Um, so those of you who aren't familiar with our work, thank you, Adam, for the wonderful introduction. Um, we are Sentient Media. Our mission is to use the power of storytelling to influence and shift public discourse so that individuals can create action by changing what's on their plates. Uh, and we do that through working with journalists to help them uh, basically include the idea that animals exist and are sentient uh, in their reporting. And it's been quite a fun challenge to do that. Uh, we also work with animal advocates to try and uh, improve media literacy in the movement. Uh, and we also rep report and publish all the stories that mainstream media often ignores, which is a lot of the work that all you are doing. And I know that people will have had challenges trying to get that message out into the media and coming across people just not, editors just not publishing the amazing work that you all are doing. Uh, so that's what we're trying to help with. Um, so if you'd have told me like three and a half years ago that I'd be standing in front of a room full of like incredible animal activists and my pitch was going to be SEO, I would have absolutely run a mile. Like before I was at Sentient Media, uh, I was actually running a digital agency, as Adam was saying. We did everything apart from SEO. Uh, and actually, when I got the job at Sentient Media, I was secretly thinking, uh, I'm going to get rid of this SEO crap because it is boring, it is stupid, I am not interested. Um, but as you can see, like three and a half years later, uh, I'm standing in front of you to try and convince you all that this is one of the most important and neglected things uh, for, that our movement could and should be doing. Um, <laughs> I really can't quite believe that I just said that. Um, so <laughs> my hope is that in the next 45 minutes, you'll not only see the potential uh, of this incredibly neglected and underfunded tactic, but you'll actually learn how to do it yourself, how you'll be able to take away some of these techniques and tips and apply it to everything that you're doing, not just SEO, but to your social media, uh, to your email campaigns, to your newsletters. It applies across the board. So, uh, and obviously I'm around today if, if anybody has any more questions or wants to dig into any of the other stuff that we're doing. Um, so as a movement, we're all doing, an, well, mainly you all are doing an amazing job uh, at corporate campaigning. It's such important work. Uh, and we even saw anybody who was at that pitch session earlier, like all of that incredible work that people are doing, it's mind blowing for me, like to see all of the successes uh, for chickens and uh, yeah, all the animals. Um, but if we don't have, like the corporate campaigning is working, but we don't have public buy-in yet. And you'll see that in the media when people are reporting on vegans, it's like, oh yeah, another crazy vegan does something crazy with a chicken or whatever. Um, so like, uh, so basically the meat and dairy industry have been really successful at using techniques um, that have been controlling public narratives time after time. So that the public, the general public thinks that when they're eating meat, it looks like this, happy cow, yay, I want to be slaughtered, um, instead of the reality. And as a movement, we have a serious uphill battle. We are suggesting an action that goes against the status quo. And that is really, really hard. But we're not the only ones who have fought this battle. 
uh, any social justice movement that has actually created significant change, like the freedom to marry, has done that by encouraging the general public to get on board with the message. So with this fight for a same-sex marriage, the general public were on board before it even became policy. But they knew that by the time that they were going in to vote, that actually we needed the whole of the public on side. Otherwise, nothing is going to happen. Nothing is going to really significantly change. If our goal is to create any kind of significant like public change or societal change, we need this public buy-in. And to get that public buy-in, we have to use the media and we have to use all of the tools that we can to get our message out to people. So we cannot control the cover of Time magazine yet, but, <laughs> but we can control the first results in Google, which again is less sexy, but you know, that's what we've got to work with. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, I was at the AVA summit. Put your hand up if you were there. Ava, all right, yeah, great. <laughs> I like it, got a woo. Um, yeah, so I was at the Ava Summit in Los Angeles. Um, you know, five days of being in this conference, it's very different from here. You're in a conference hotel, you're in an airport hotel, you don't really see the outside world, and you're like, you're kind of, you're in this little, like, very, well, big kind of vegan bubble. And after five days of being in this bubble, um, like, you, yeah, it's a whole thing. You have to go if you haven't been. It's, it's very exciting and very fun, but it's a whole thing. So a few of us decided to, like, leave the conference uh, and go out into the real, like, outside world, which felt very magical to us. Um, and in L.A., you have to get a taxi to get anywhere, right? Uh, so we got a cab. This guy, Abiyana, picked us up. Um, <laughs> Why did he get a laugh? Um, and we were all brain fried, but you know, you can't help but talk about the conference. So we were chatting about what was going on. And I always get this like, I don't know if anybody else gets it, but like a weird tension when you're talking kind of unfiltered about vegan stuff. Somebody's nodding, yes. Uh, in front of like, you know, normal people, you're like, oh, I don't want them to think we're crazy, but okay. Um, anyway, it turned out he had actually seen some factory farming footage. Uh, and he was like, oh yeah, have you seen how they slaughter animals? And I was like, uh-huh, yep, <laughs> just a bit. Um, and I had to ask him, like, okay, dude, like, do you eat meat? And I just hoped that he was going to say no, but he did. He did still eat meat. Um, and he asked if we were vegan. We were like, yes. And he asked why. And I was like, I'm too tired to answer this. Somebody else answer it. Uh, so our managing editor, Jenny Splitter, she answered. And she went vegan for the climate uh, like three years ago. Um, and this blew his mind because he knew that like uh, climate crisis was caused by like cars and air pollution and planes and things like that. But he had never thought that what he ate made an impact on the environment. In fact, he had a Tesla because he cared so much about the climate. Um, but he had no idea uh, about the impact of animal agriculture. And he went on to ask a load of really interesting questions, which I wrote down because I was like, oh, this is what real people like ask. Uh, so he was like, you know, when he found out that it was burps that caused the emissions, he was like, oh, how much does one burp emit? And I was like, oh, interesting. Um, so in LA, you, those who have been, like you have this fantastic traffic situation where you can be at a standstill for like half an hour and not get anywhere. Uh, so at one point he pulls out his phone uh, and he starts to Google uh, eating less meat climate. And I started to like freak out a little bit. I was like, oh, what's he gonna find? Um, and he started reading, it was like, um, oh, so eating less meat can reduce pressure on forests. That's really exciting. I never thought of that before. Uh, and I looked like over his shoulder uh, and I like lost my shit. Like, because what he was looking at was a sentient media article that we had specifically designed to be in front of people like Abiyana who have had something prompt them to ask a question. What is, what is my diet? What is what's on my plate doing to the climate? And there we are, yes! <laughs> And now Aviano is on his journey to reduce his meat consumption, like because of the, obviously the videos that he saw, but also because of reading this content. It like blew my mind to read the, to see this kind of playing out um, in front of me in real life. The truth is, like when people like Aviano have questions, they turn to Google. You know, we all do. And yes, there are other platforms that do it. We can talk about that if there are any questions. But Google is like one of the areas where we decide what the status quo is. You know, when he, when he looked at this, he didn't read that it was sentient media. He just read the snippet. So if you get that snippet status, like you win, people just believe you. And you know, I do too. Uh, like I often, like if I Google something quickly, like a health thing or whatever, I will just believe what the snippet says. Oh, drinking wine is actually good for you, cool. Um, and this is why it's so important for us as a movement to be there in that snippet and in those top results in Google. 
um, it starts to shape what the status quo is and what is socially acceptable. So time and time again, like when mainstream media covers a campaign that one of you are doing, uh, say you get some celebrity involved and there's some kind of little PR spike, after people see that content, they then turn to Google and they say, oh, okay, so that Grand National stuff, the Animal Rising content, uh, the Animal Rising um, protests uh, of the Grand National in the UK this year, oh, people started Googling in the UK about horse racing. This is what people do when these moments happen. And in order to kind of really capitalize on that momentum, we have to be in this snippet status. It could be you know, a curious student like doing their homework. It could be uh, a journalist, an academic, uh, an influencer, or you know, a, let's face it, eventually an AI bot. Uh, <laughs> but whoever they are, what they find on Google, especially in those top results, really shapes their understanding, uh, their work, and their behavior. And in turn, that starts to shape uh, what is and isn't socially, uh, socially acceptable. So when Abiyana saw that snippet and started reading it as truth, uh, this to me was just the most perfect like example of, of what I want us all to do together. And whatever your approach to media is, like it's a fact that as a society, we do not teach people how to read media critically. Uh, we do not teach people how to fact check. Uh, and it's vital that they see us there, right? Uh, we want to be there uh, as a movement, not, you know, content like this. And this literally says why eating meat is good for the environment. Okay. If that was what Abiyana was reading, what would he do? He would be like, oh, actually, that's going to confirm my diet and I'm just going to continue doing what I'm doing. So in the last three and a half years, the team at Sentient Media, we've worked with many animal protection groups. Some, in fact, Synergia Animal, who are doing the uh, other talk right now about the Global South, we've been working with them for the last 12 months. We worked with the Humane League, uh, Aquatic Life Institute, VFC, Nutrition Facts, etc. We've worked with loads of organizations to generate content that now appears in the top uh, three slots in Google for over 14,000 different search terms. So it could be like factory farming, chicken farming, anything like that. And when it comes to chicken farming, again, for anybody who was in that pitch, uh, elevator pitch session just now, so many groups are working on chicken farming. Uh, it gives us this really fantastic opportunity to actually come together as a movement uh, and strategically outrank all of the pro chicken agriculture people. So as a direct result of this work, we are reshaping the conversation for people like Abiyana from like, you know, yay, Tyson food to wait a minute, you know, maybe chicken farming isn't as straightforward as we thought. So when your campaigns hit the news, we really want these search engines to back up your narrative, our narrative. And on top of this, all the content that you create actually stays, it's, it's organic. So it's not like paying for Facebook ads. When you're doing Facebook ads, like you have to pay the beast. If you stop feeding the beast, the clicks go away. So in 2023 alone, um, we have, the content that we've created has reached uh, 102 million people with our headlines across the globe. Um, we have, uh, the, the cost per click equivalent, this is where it gets like really neat, especially for anybody into efficiency. Like on every single level, this tactic makes sense. Um, the cost per click for, for the traffic that we generated would have cost over a million dollars, but the actual spend that we had on it was about $98,000 instead. So even like from any kind of angle that you're looking at it, it's like, it just makes sense. Uh, and there isn't a constant drip of money that you need to do for this kind of thing. It's like, uh, once you've created it, it ranks and it continues to rank for the best part. So, you know, now you're probably seeing why, like, I am fully into SEO, even though it's like a kind of a technical, like, whatever. Uh, it is, has so much power to actually shift and shape narratives. And it's something that we can actually do. Um, so it's not rocket science. As I said at the start, I am definitely not an SEO expert. So any questions that you do have that are very like technical, I can definitely refer that to my team. Um, but I do want to get into the practical tips that I have learned and that I have seen work time and time again uh, from my time at Sentient Media and the amazing people that I've been working with. Um, so in this moment, I was going to show you a quick video um, of, <laughs> thank you, uh, of an article. I figured it would be fun to kind of reverse engineer, well, fun. Uh, it would be interesting to reverse engineer the article that Abiyana found so you can see all of the work that went into it to get it into that position. Um, so you can see it's like, oh no, you can't see. Okay, we can see now. <laughs> 
I don't know why Keynote wouldn't like export a video, so it was kind of hard for me. Okay, so here is the whole article. So thank you so much. So you can see that it's really long. Um, it's very detailed, it's very thorough. Uh, there is a lot of work that goes into this. So that's why the groups that we work with, we often create the content for them uh, because it can be really overwhelming because you're really busy doing your other stuff, right? Uh, you don't really you know, wanna spend all of your time doing SEO content. Um, there's a lot of length and a lot of detail, a lot of work that goes into these pieces. That's it. <laughs> um, so we're going to dig into what we did to get that article. Oh, it's going to replay. There we go. Um, we're going to dig into uh, what we did to get it uh, on that first page. Um, so firstly, and one of the most important things that you need to do is uh, create a website audit. Um, this is absolutely vital um, because the website audit examines everything that's going on uh, on the back end of your of your of your website, obviously. Uh, and there can be certain things that you do that actually block Google from seeing you. Uh, so we worked with one group, for example, who had some error in the back end. And then after we fixed it, uh, they started getting approached by donors. It's like these people wanted to give them money, but they couldn't find them because Google literally just couldn't see them. Uh, and the, so we, we conduct the audit. Folks at uh, organizations like Vegan Hacktivists up at the back there, uh, they can actually uh, use their team of volunteers, uh, volunteer developers to actually help implement those changes. Um, and you can have a website that actually functions. It's like, you know, cleaning up your house before you invite your guests over. That's basically the number one thing you have to do. Um, the next thing is you need to think about the uh, keyword. So you need to really carefully think about the keyword that you're selecting. Um, when we talk about keyword and uh, search volume, what we're talking about is the number of individuals who are actually typing into Google the phrase that you want to, your organization to appear for. So for us, we're doubling down on uh, the relationship between climate crisis uh, and meat consumption. So any keyword that's about meat and climate, we want to be there. But we don't want to be there for words that nobody's searching for. So we want to make sure that we're using terminology and phrases that people are actually using. And that means that we can get into situations where we have to use phrases that we wouldn't personally use in our like normal vocabulary. So I wouldn't want to call cows livestock, for example, but in order to reach people, I'm going to need to use that phrase. I wouldn't want to call cultivated meat lab grown meat, but in order to reach people, that's what I'm going to have to use. Um, I recommend that you look at like Google Trends and that you, you, there are some free tools I'll show you in a second um, that you can use. But if you're trying to create content from like an idealistic standpoint, rather than from like a realistic, I need to be in front of people standpoint, you're not gonna reach people. You're not gonna be a, pa a part of shifting this narrative so that people are more accepting of animals. Um, it's not exactly ideal, but it is, it's the reality of meeting people where they're at. Um, and then you, you want to see if there's any kind of unique question that you can answer. So you have this really wonderful opportunity that you know so much nuance within the work that you're doing that if there's a question like, is veganism healthy? Sure, there's like loads of content for that. But if you added something more nuanced to it, like is veganism healthy long term? That's something that actually when I last checked, it didn't have an article that was specifically written for that phrase. Um, but you could create that article. There were a lot of people searching for that content, but there was nothing there for them to find that was specific. Um, and then you want to create an outline. Uh, so your outline is going to be like a real kind of serious breakdown of like all the different uh, headers, all the different paragraphs, all the different uh, phrases that you want to hit. I'm going to show you exactly what this outline looked like. Um, in a second. Uh, and anybody who has written, an, is anybody a journalist or has anybody been a writer or a comms person or written? Right. So every, uh, a lot of you write, yeah. So every single article that you write, you're going to create an outline. Like you want to know where am I going with this story? It's exactly the same with SEO, but you just think of it as like Google's outline. Uh, and then a couple of like technical important things is like word length. So uh, word length is surprisingly long, as you saw that piece. You're looking at pieces that are like 1,200 to 1,700 words, which is obviously long, and it takes a lot of work to create that content. Um, fun fact, that's why recipe pages, you know when you're on a recipe and you're looking for, right, yeah, you know, uh, when you're looking for a recipe and you have to scroll like all the way to the bottom after all this crap about whatever their personal journey was to find this recipe. Um, that's SEO, I'm sorry, um, but it works. Um, and then publishing cadence, uh, like that is really important. This is something that I have learned and I've seen work and I've seen when you don't follow this rule, it doesn't work. Uh, so you have to publish on the same day of the week, every single week forever. Um, so you have to pick your day. So say it's a Wednesday. Wednesday will be your SEO day. At Senate Media, we have two SEO days a week. 
Um, I think it's like Tuesdays and Thursdays or something. Uh, so if you, wanna, if you want to actually take an SEO strategy seriously, you need to create one piece of content every week that's specifically SEO in mind. Google loves predictability and routine, uh, and it will not uh, reward you if you don't follow that rule. It's just like a, a weird thing. You have to ask Google why. Um, and then picking a headline we'll get into in a second. So with the keyword stuff, here are two free tools, uh, Ubersuggest and Ahrefs. Um, so they have limited features for the free option, um, but it is still useful. Uh, so you can see here, eating meat bad for the environment, uh, 210 search volume. Uh, so that's great. So we're going to go for that. Anything over 100, I think you should consider something worth going for, really. Uh, if, if you find a key phrase that you really like, but it's less than 100, then just write the article as a normal article. You know, don't put all of the energy that you have to put into to create an SEO content. Um, okay. And then, uh, so we want to get onto writing our outline. So there are like kind of like very easy, like uh, quick hacks that you can do to, to create your outline. The first kind of obvious thing is you want to look at all of the content that's on the first page. So you Google your phrase that you want to rank for, and then you look and read those articles that have got those slots that you want to rank for. Uh, and then you break it down, like what are their headers? What are their subheaders? Google does it for you with its what, el what else do people ask? And you want to pick like what, what else do people ask and what headlines do I want to pick from, from this to create that kind of really long headline, uh, sorry, that really long outline. Um, and then you kind of get this skeleton that, of what the article, what the final article is going to be. Uh, you can also use some paid tools, some AI software, some AI bots and things like that. You can use like ChatGPT to be like, hey, what would be a good SEO outline for this? Um, but I would always recommend like you have to apply your own, like, you, you know, you have to apply your human brain to it as well. Um, you have to think about like, is, does this phrase make sense? Uh, also with ChatGPT, obviously the content that it's creating is outdated, well, is drawing from outdated information. Uh, so it's important to remember that everything that it gets is, is not up to date. So you want to make sure that you're using your own methods as well as that. It's like a, a kind of a pile of different free tools that you can put together to create something that actually makes sense for you and your organization. Um, you know, no one really knows what's going to happen with AI tools, obviously, but what we do know is the content is going to be derivative by nature. It's by design derivative content. So the more you can double down on what would appeal to like a human from a human uh, when you're coming to like generating content, like the better it will be and the more sustainable it will be in the long term. Um, but I can't pretend that I know exactly what direction it's going to go in. Uh, so here is the final outline. Um, don't all like copy this and like <laughs> write your own exact version. Um, but no, it's uh, here's the exact outline that we finished with. Um, so you can see that there's like H2s, H3s, H4s. This is like the technical side. You want to make sure that like the headers are nested uh, correctly together. Uh, you want to make sure you're using the correct URL format. You want to have your investigation of like what are the other first page results. You want to create a good word count um, based on the on the content that's out there. Um, and yeah, all of this again, like all of this searching for these keywords can definitely help with like social media and other campaigns because actually like the things that people are searching for are going to be, that, that's what they're searching for online, on social media, like in all of the different uh, places that you find people. So we're going to get into headlines now. Um, so with headlines, creating a good headline, uh, you want to make sure that the keywords are closer to the start than at the end. So that key phrase that you want to rank for, you want to make sure that's at the beginning because Google can be a little bit lazy and just wants it given to it. So you want to put those keywords at the front. Um, so you can use several keywords. You can pick like different things that you want to rank for, keep them in there. You don't want to like overdo it so it looks unnatural and weird, but like do have a few keywords in there that you want to rank for. Um, Ultimately, you want to think about what you would search for as well. Like, what would you click on? What would you actually like to read? You're probably going to be creating content for people like you, for people who care about the things that you care about. So do think about, would I click on this? You can even have like a look through your like web history and see like, what is the uh, pattern of different headlines that I'm clicking on? Like, does this, is this something, does this look like something that I would click on? Is this something that I would want to read? You know, you want to write socially. You want to write with people in mind. This is something that we want somebody to read. We want it to change their life and change their attitude. We don't just want to put like a, a brain dump on there of uh, a load of just kind of clickbaity stuff. We want it to be real. 
Um, our, in case this is a bit dry for you, uh, our assistant editor, Rachel Kranst, likes to think of it like this. Uh, a good headline is like a good mullet. Um, so you put your keywords up front and then you have a party in the back. And mullets are like fashionable again now. I've seen quite a few mullets lately. Um, so just have a look. These are really good examples of uh, key phrases, uh, key headlines. Um, and you can see there's like, there's extra words in there. There's like, you know, clickbaity stuff. There's also like interest, there's nuance. They're trying to create uh, something that uh, people would want to read. Okay. Um, so there are a couple of like, I mean, we could go through like the whole article, but the most important parts are like the first paragraph and the last paragraph. Uh, so we're going to look briefly at the first paragraph. You want to make sure that you have uh, at least one keyword, the keyword that you want to rank for in that first paragraph. You want to make sure that if you're using any kind of like celebrity name or politician name, you use the full name because Google wants to know exactly who you're talking about. Uh, you don't want to put any embeds or pictures in the first two or three hundred words apart from the featured image. Featured image stays as it is, as you can see, but you don't want to put anything in in any pictures or stuff above two or three hundred words because Google doesn't like um, Google doesn't like having to look through embeds uh, and you don't want to link the first three or four words of an article um, for some reason I don't know why Google doesn't like that um, but you do want to link to two or three you see it's like it's very technical but these things like work and I, I, I see when people don't do it that it doesn't actually work and when people do do it it works so it's it's technical but it's it's what works um, yeah, so then the next uh, aspect of general practice, best practice throughout the article, um, you want to make sure that uh, basically when Google is reading your article, it reads the links. So it kind of like skims all of the links throughout your article uh, in order to get its understanding of it. So you want to link as much as you can keywords that make sense. So any link that you do needs to be like three to eight words long. Uh, basically, and you want to make sure that when you're linking out, if you're linking out like two or three times, you want to link back to your own website like three or four times. You want to try and keep links going backwards into your own website as much as you can. Um, and you want to make sure when you are linking out, you're linking to like reputable sites. Um, it is very likely that the kind of content you would create, we would have spoken about at Sentient Media. Uh, so you can always link to us if you don't have the content on your own site yet. Um, uh, yes, oh, and Google punishes you if you do not uh, link to related content. Uh, so you want to make sure you link to related content. Um, okay, last paragraph. Uh, this is very important as well. Um, you want to try and include the keyword a couple of times if you can. But I think more importantly for us, uh, we want to think about what action we want to drive. Uh, so we want to make sure that if we're saying like we want to push them towards alternative protein or to sign a petition or to donate, that's what we want to kind of recommend to them in this last paragraph. We want to get them excited about creating this change. And take a step back and think like, why do people Google stuff? People mainly Google stuff for hypochondria because they want to confirm like normalcy bias, because they have shame, because they want information, because of curiosity, and not on this list, uh, but shopping as well, of course. So you want to think about which bucket you're sitting in. For us, it's information and curiosity. So if I know that I'm seeking people who are curious and interested and wanting information, then I'm going to make sure my content is created, my headlines are created with that in mind. You want to basically merge your mind and become at one with Google. Um, <laughs> I think I'm absolutely pathetic now, by the way. I can like hear myself talking about Google like this, but it is so important and it's so simple and it's like these little tricks really do work. Um, so maybe you can just grab a picture of this and we'll, uh, we'll move on. Um, yeah, I think like one of the, the, the key things is really about the links, making sure you're going to the right places, links to reputable sites, uh, other headers in the right hierarchy, all of these kind of technical things that basically allow Google to, uh, to, to see what it is that you're doing. And for those of you who are interested, this is how it played out in the analytics side for Abiena's story. So you can see we published the article like back in December, and it wasn't until like three, four months later that we actually started to see traction. Uh, SEO is always a marathon, not a sprint. So when you create content, it can take months to actually see growth. So if you do know what your campaigns are going to be for the next year, you want to plan ahead. If you know that in like April, you, you want people to be finding you for chicken related content, then start creating that content in December. You don't need to shout about it on social media, but just have it on your website. And then when the time comes, people will be able to actually find you. Um, but you can see what's really cool here is the snippet status that it's achieved. This was just this uh, July. Um, it achieved a different snippet. Uh, 
um, for uh, than what Aviena found. So when you've created this content like really carefully, you can actually get snippet status and you can actually rank in number one, two, and three for all kinds of different phrases that you've referenced throughout the article. So one piece of content could account for like 15 top keywords. Uh, and what's really cool about this as well is the dwell time and the bounce rate. So that's, people are staying on this page for like two and a half minutes, which is like unheard of for like SEO content. Uh, and they're staying, the, the bounce rate is 30%, which is ridiculously low. But that's because we put so much time and energy into making sure that this is content that people actually want to read. And that's what Google is rewarding. So I'd like to invite everybody here to join our Animal Advocacy Media Network, where we kind of go deep on these things. We have courses, they're all free. It's free to join. Um, I would like you to be in there, come and meet the community. Uh, we were a community of about a thousand, and now we've kind of gone down into more like niche, smaller community areas. Um, so I'd love for you to, to see you in there. You know, I truly believe that like the more media and digital savvy we apply to our work as a movement, uh, the more we'll reach people, the more we'll change the landscape and we'll change the public discourse. Uh, and this is a huge part of it. And it's super basic and super simple. Uh, and then hopefully, maybe one day, you can be as pathetic as me about Google and get like overexcited in the back of a taxi somewhere or in a bar when somebody like Googles something and your site and your work comes up. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. So now uh, on to the Q&A. We'll have time for a few questions. Uh, firstly, Assuming the meat industry has access to mm -hmm. the same SEO techniques as we do, is there anything specific to animal advocacy movement that we could use to our advantage in this fight for visibility, which after all is a competitive one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they have much more money than us. So they put millions and billions of dollars into actual digital marketing. Yeah, uh, it's a really good question. It's something that I think about a lot. Um, I think that what I was saying about like the nuance and the uh, the kind of the personal angle and the fact that we have all of this expertise as a movement for, for these kinds of questions will help us. And I also think that coming together collectively is really powerful. Uh, so I think that like when we have you know multiple groups working together for certain key phrases to dominate the first page, they can't really fight with us. Um, they, I think, and I might talk about editing this video um, before it goes out to like everybody, but um, I think that like they're not super threatened by us yet. Um, they don't need to be worried at this moment in time. Um, I would like them to worry uh, at some point. Um, but yeah, I think that we're, we're, we're not a threat at this moment in time, but we're getting there, I think, in, in terms of like all of the media work that we're doing as a movement. And yeah, perhaps the truth in many areas is on our side, which can be helpful in this. So yes. yeah, yes. <laughs> the next question, how can you push someone else down in search results, like in the chicken example? Uh, did you see the talk? Um, that's like, that's definitely, you have to do an SEO strategy. So uh, does it just say, how do you push somebody down? Yeah, yeah. I so, guess. okay. So you have to create content following a more rigorous SEO procedure, like the one we just uh, went through. Um, and then your content will be rewarded by Google. It takes time. You want to do it regularly. Uh, you want to make sure your website is in order. But if you're ultimately creating content that uh, is more thorough, more detailed, more nuanced, and uh, follows all of the SEO things, if you've become one with Google, then you can do it. This is the example I just showed isn't the only example of us doing this. We've done it many, many, many times. In some cases, we pushed uh, them off the first page altogether. Um, so yeah, these techniques are what's going to really help you actually push them down. But it takes time and it takes like, yeah, you have to do a lot of articles. We've been doing it for like four years now. So so you basically only push them down by creating your own content that gets ahead of them, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next question, um, how do you strike balance between making the article informative and attracting attention? Or are those two things not necessarily in conflict? No, yeah, I, I think that like the, the headline is your really important part in this question. So I think that creating a headline that people want to click on uh, is the most important thing that has those keyword structures. Um, and then creating an article that actually somebody wants to read. Uh, I don't think that they're in conflict with each other. I think that they complement each other and you need to use, you know, it's like using a teaser trailer in order to get people to see the movie. It's like you have to think about what are the key like things that are going to make somebody actually want to read this article and get informed. And as people use Google uh, as an information and a curiosity, you know, exchange, that makes it uh, even better if you're giving them just pure information. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, do you or are you considering to do content in languages other than English? Yeah, uh, yeah. So right now we're, we've just got a grant from um, EA Animal Welfare Fund to translate uh, a lot of our SEO content into Spanish, um, and we're working on building like in-country specific stuff in like uh, uh, all the Spanish-speaking countries in um, South America and Spain. Um, so yeah, we're working on that right now. Um, yeah, and I'd love to do more. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, a different uh, question. I think it's a bit open to interpretation uh, how you answer it, but do you weigh in the problem of repeating stupid questions which are frequently asked in Google searches mm. instead of not repeating wrong facts, even if packed as a question? Um, okay, so so asking quite like do you ha like how much do you engage with like stupid questions yeah i think i think like competing with uh yeah, oh with okay some. yeah 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 okay yeah so uh every single outline like uh you know that you create you have to think like what makes sense for you as an organization um so if there are certain like phrases that come up that are just seem uh i mean to be honest like i would probably recommend answering um the questions that you think i mean what's an example of a stupid question None was provided, but I suppose there's a few of them. Um, yeah, I think you, you probably have to take it on a case by case basis and see like what makes sense um, for your organization to do. And I think that if, if people are Googling a certain question time and time again, it's something that you, you want to engage with. It's something that you want to see and you want to have your, your campaign or your work there uh, rather than um, something stupid. I don't. Yeah. Okay, so let's let's have two or three more. Um, another one, I've heard that CEO, uh, SEO uh, takes a longer time than the other tactics to show results. Could you please comment on that and to what time frame organizations should expect to test SEO in? Yes, so I would recommend anybody trying to do SEO uh, in the ideal world would be trying it for at least one year. Um, I think that it's... it's, it's <sighs> It's a time intensive uh, process. It's a lot of work and that's why we try to kind of provide services where we can do it for free or we can do it at very low cost uh, for organizations in the movement. Um, you don't see results. You don't start to see results until your website has been fixed. So your back end of your website needs to be fixed. That can take months sometimes. Uh, you don't see results until you've been publishing regular SEO work with a proper cadence for like, you know, multiple months at a time. So it could be six months as you saw with that Abiena article, like uh, that piece didn't start to rank for like four months, even though we were already established, you know, uh, like high quality by Google website. Um, it still does. It still didn't gain traction. But I think that like what you want to do is kind of zoom out a bit and think like of the bigger picture of like, actually, uh, if we as a movement are there for all of these questions in the long term, and if we try and maintain that position for all of these key phrases related to anything to do with animal exploitation, then we're doing something much bigger than just winning our campaign. We're actually changing like the public discourse. Uh, we're actually being present in Google and starting to shift how people think about things. Um, but in terms of winning campaigns faster, uh, so one of our clients we worked with, the Humane League USA, they say that they're actually winning campaigns faster now because of applying these tactics uh, for looking at keywords, looking at phrases, looking at things like that in order to reach mainstream audiences and in order to, uh, yeah, to, in order to get success with their campaigns. So yeah, it takes time, but it's definitely, definitely worth it. Okay, last one that we have time for. It's a rapid fire one, oh. blog posts or sub pages. Uh, I don't know what that means. <laughs> uh, I, I, to be honest, blog I, posts or sub pages? Does I mean are we allowed to ask who asked it? Or, uh, or not? Okay, okay. So I'd I'll, be happy I'll, to answer it, but I, I just I'll don't understand. Uh, yeah. So please, uh, whoever asked yeah, that, uh, reach out me. to Anna directly okay. uh, with clarification. So I'll ask a different one. Do you think SEO is an important uh, as important when sending out a press release about our campaigns? Should we focus on keywords there as well? Okay, so press releases is a whole thing. Um, SEO, I think, is much better and more effective than press releases um, for the simple reason that journalists Google things and Google questions. So at Sentient Media, we actually get referenced uh, by multiple journalists like almost every single day in articles because we come up as a fact. Uh, and that's starting to happen to like the Humane League. Um, so people are Googling, you know, like chicken stuff and the Humane League will come up. So people are actually, journalists are now referencing that work because they themselves are discovering it. Um, so I actually think that SEO as an intervention to reach journalists is way more effective than press releases. 
Okay, thanks a lot for okay. the presentation and the, uh, answering the question.